<coughs> Our next speakers um, are Irene Ruhle, Manchester Business School, and Sonja Ruhle, Suas. Thank you very much. Um, I'm just going to contextualise our paper a, a little bit um, before we go into the PowerPoint. And first of all, I wanted to say what a good opportunity it is for us to present this kind of paper uh, in a conference in which a lot of personal um, characteristics of, of Edith Penrose herself have been discussed, and also the theme of managers as people, sentient beings with discretion and, and so on, um, has been a theme. And this is good for our context for this paper, since it is a paper written from a specific point of view, that of the management practitioner, uh, particularly, and also that of the management or executive educator, who is, in a sense, a facilitator of the absorption of theoretical perspectives and propositions from academia, including um, these uh, themes and perspectives that have either been based on Edith Penrose or not, but anyway, in which Edith Penrose has been seminal. Um, so our paper is based, if you like, on participant observation of the managerial education process, and in Irene's case particularly, um, that also of a, a management practitioner herself. Our paper is a bit different in texture from the others for that reason, um, uh, because of its uh, basis in participant observation. And also because it was written with this conference in mind. We were very cognizant of time limits, and therefore our vignettes, which we go into here, should be seen as complementary to our paper and not a summary of it. We try to have illustrative vignettes of the main points that we have picked out. So, our overview, first of all, we follow in the footsteps of previous authors setting out and celebrating a legacy of continuing relevance, both theoretically, as, as said, and also practically, our uh, emphasis being on the receipt of uh, resource-based and capabilities-informed views by practitioners. And these are the main sections that we look at, the importance of internal resources in context, complexity, ambiguity, and relativity being an important aspect of this, quite counterintuitive to many managers receiving these ideas, the importance of organisational learning but also unlearning, and the complexity of capabilities that firms might be said to need from now. So turning a Penrosean lens on the internal resources of the firm we picked out as very important, needed as being needed for managers to judge where the main locus of competitive advantage for their firm lies now in the external context of the firm. And in practice, it has been found that managers specifically need to look, to be encouraged to look using these views and Penrosian lenses and so on, outside the existing rules of the game because that tends to be um, what is easiest, to look at the usual suspects, uh, to look at the existing framework of competition and not outside it. Not taking a wide enough perspective can be something that managers need to be prodded into doing. We thought that this was a very nice um, visual metaphor, if you like, for the importance of context and the need to see internal resources in context in a relative kind of way. This is Joseph Alva's exercise on colour interaction and I think from where you're sitting, it possibly is hard to believe, but these cross, uh, crossed lines are actually in the same colour, and the difference in, the, in our perception of them simply arises from their contextualisation against the background. A good metaphor, we thought, for the importance of context. So complexity and ambiguity and relativity, we argue, are positive advantages of taking a resource-based or capabilities perspective. And we illustrate that here by um, the difficulty, the complexity, even of a seemingly simple decision over what to make, what to outsource in practice. So Hewlett Packard suggests a recent case of such complexity. I'm not going to go into all the complexities of it, obviously, but just to point out that even such a simple, seemingly simple rule of thumb is not easy in practice. 
2001, Hewlett Packard, for example, decides to go even uh, larger into computer making by purchasing compact computers. Ten years later, uh, it's doing, in a way, the opposite by uh, spending $11 billion on acquiring autonomy, a much regretted decision, of course, but a decision that goes, if you like, in the opposite direction. 2011, the, the chief executive declares that Hewlett Packard is better together, and that's not a reference to the Scottish referendum, actually, um, but uh, thinking that Hewlett Packard uh, is better off remaining a diversified conglomerate, for example, with cash flows from printers and, and PC making, um, despite articulated views at the time that no company can excel or expect to excel at both consumer and enterprise consuming uh, at the same time. <coughs> 2014, a split has, however, been announced by the same chief executive, not better together, but better apart. A split has been announced such that uh, HP Incorporated will be a printer and PC uh, maker aimed at the consumer market and the, such purchases within the firm, whereas Enterprise will be a business-focused uh, company focusing on hardware, software, and services and um, all of the complex acquisitions that that focus might imply in the future. I've raised through that vignette, but I'm going to hand over to Irena to discuss the others from here. And again, as, as Simon mentioned, our approach in this paper is very much um, targeted at practitioners. That's in part because at um, Manchester Business School, I spent all my time working with practitioners on strategy in two ways. One is on so-called strategy facilitation, which is essentially, to use Shine's terminology, process facilitation, working to use the jargon with senior leadership teams, helping them on the strategy making process, very much as a facilitator in the knowledge that they have the resources, the expertise, and you're trying to tease that out of them and help using strategic management concepts in that process. And the other part is in what I would call conventional executive education programs. And I think this is where the number of times that clients ask us that we need to get our folk at whatever level, the top, the middle, senior level, to think more strategically. Now, the seven years that I've had at, um, at MBS, uh, are really the common refrain that just, it's very, very rare not to hear it, is if only we had time to think. <laughs> if only we had time to think. And this desire, which is, I find still quite extraordinary, but the need, we engage with the client, this desire, we need the plan, and I'm not exaggerating it, we need it at the end of the week, but we need it at the end of the month. And what I found really fascinating, as a practitioner, I come from practice, I used to be a, a grocer for both M&S and Tesco, is that one of the most um, influential best approaches to break that thinking down and get them to realize oh, you need to stay still, to stop and think, is actually to use um, Penrose, or Edith Penrose certainly started it, as we've heard. I think Eve made that very, very clear. I think it, also Christos yesterday, you mentioned a number of things. There's shed loads of jargon in the strategy um, field, whether it's value creation, value capture, co-creation, I could go on. And really, all of that we can, in a sense, thank Edith Penrose for, because a lot of what she wrote about, she didn't use that terminology, but she was using. And I find that my, my experience is that if you can get managers to actually step off the hamster wheel, which they find incredibly challenging, I find the use of the resource-based view of the firm dynamic capabilities can be a way in that. And so what I'd like to do is a very short vignette, which is Tesco, and I've you know, we've titled it Capability Development, Success and Eventual Erosion. Um, this is actually something like, um, this is a timeline, I presume it's not terribly legible on the slide, but we're going from start-up, Cohen family, <coughs> just after the 1950s, to sort of next year and beyond, 2015 and beyond. 
And again, let me stress that these are just, it's illustrative um, to get some of the points across. But in the 1950s, it started up. About 20 years later, it was very much with, um, the, uh, with Ian McLaren, who came into the firm as chief executive, who really professionalised the firm. And I think one of the key things that the decisions were made in this period, the following 10 years, of very, a lot of consolidation taking place, massive investment in strategic architecture. What tends to get mentioned about Tesco is its massive investment in technology. What is not often mentioned is this huge <coughs> investment in people, in different people, to the ones they used to employ. It actually enjoyed, in the late, um, the late 70s, early 80s, it had an extraordinarily high number of PhD graduates in working in Chesnut in head office. Um, the, um, the, the, what they were doing, to use the ghastly jargon, is knowledge orchestration. They were absolutely um, at the forefront of market intelligence, particularly employing geographers to really push the area of network planning. They were, in my day, when I was at Tesco, in the days when they were building 30 to 35 superstores a year, then, um, and I'm not exaggerating, it's well known, that within a 10% variance, we could estimate the annual revenue of, of a Tesco store. That was all around knowledge and capabilities, and really, um, you know, network planning, supply chain management, an awful lot of, of, um, of uh, market research as well. What this curve that tends to show, some of you might be familiar with it, because it, it actually forms the same shape as Jim Collins' um, Good to Great uh, of 2001, is this doesn't indicate the revenues or profit, it's, it's really our perspective of actually what happened to Tesco's resources from a resource-based view of the firm perspective, from a capabilities perspective, what actually happened in Tesco during this time. And I think what's absolutely fascinating is that um, many of you will know at its peak in 1995, um, it actually beat the, the uh, Sainsbury's, the, 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 leader, the market leader at the time in the UK. But really, um, as it reached that market leadership, what is quite extraordinary is it is a firm which, in my opinion, was extremely good over time at developing capabilities actually trying to, to build and develop those dynamic capabilities and somehow, you know, in spite of the launch of the loyalty card or the customer entrapment card, which morphs into Dunhumby, a wholly owned subsidiary, which is now valued at over two billion pounds, still wholly owned by the company, um, it starts to actually weigh those dynamic capabilities. And what's so fascinating is that it's much heralded. I experienced this more when I was at the business school and we were working with Tesco on a very, um, a very regular basis with store managers and um, regional managers was the launch of the Step Change Programme. The Step Change Programme was purely around reducing costs reducing costs. They were incredibly successful in that process, but to the point where they started to fail to learn, essentially. Um, and during this time, they started to enter into new markets, but what the fascinating thing is, as they did really well in terms of revenue and performance, their, their, their um, capability um, started to decline. And really, that's all I'm trying to show here. So, from 2005, if we look at the, at, these, at the statistics, then we can see actually Tesco did phenomenally well. It's in 2009, it, it's uh, got its highest um, turnover yet, highest profitability, etc. But actually, more of the same, the dominant logic, to use um, Brahma's terminology, had already set in. And essentially, those dynamic capabilities have been <coughs> eroded. Um, What's so fascinating is they resorted to type. They're still finding it quite hard to, ch to change, even now, with a new managing director. So I think what's really interesting about this is, in part, um, from a dynamic capability perspective, 
what business are they in? You know, one of the fundamental questions which we always ask when in the days I, I remember when I did business policy a long time ago, before it was called business strategy, one of the fundamental questions was always what business is it in? And I think again, using the resource to choose a fair perspective, that can be very helpful in getting us to explore what some of the fundamental challenges are. In addition to which, I think one of the critical ones related to learning and unlearning is this knowing doing gap. So I, I think that um, one of the challenges that Tesco faces, for example, is they know that they need to change. They know what they need to do, but actually uh, the rigidities, the core rigidities within the organisation make it extremely hard for them. And so I think it relates um, to, to the paper yesterday, this morning, about how very difficult this is, sort of, this, this, trying to make sense of it, and then how, what do you do with that is inc incredibly hard. So what I wanted to link it with, and again, this goes very, I'm going to spend very little time on this, but it's, um, it's related very much, I think, to the speakers yesterday afternoon, Marcella and Antonio, um, where this is from uh, McGee at Warwick, who really extended grants thinking of the knowledge-based view of the firm. I won't spend much time with it, because essentially it's explored in wonderful depth yesterday um, and essentially the, you know, the argument is from a resource-based view of the firm perspective that most firms are dealing with with um, multiple markets not ne not necessarily mutually exclusive and one of the core the, sort of the fundamental question going back to business definition is actually what do we need to keep within the organization what must we be keep within? What are we able to both um, outsource? With whom do we collaborate? We might have to collaborate with competitors that might have very significant um, implications. So, it really, this is a, a, a um, the big picture I think of what Antonio was looking at of actually looking at clusters and clusters of activities across a whole value system of exploring actually what does this mean for the firm? What capabilities do we then need to have? What do we have to have in house in terms of core competencies or distinctive capabilities? What do we need to, uh, how do we actually evolve that? And how do we co create value with potential um, partners? upstream or downstream. This new complexity, I think, um, is especially hard, and I think it's a huge opportunity. That's what I think is so fascinating, is the criticism which is often leveled, uh, which was again raised, Crystal, I seem to remember that you mentioned it, and others have mentioned it, uh, around Edith Penrose, is, well, it's, um, I know you didn't use that terminology, but this is what colleagues at MBS often throw at me, is, Irena, it's just, you know, Penrose is actually not very helpful, because it's just the systemization of common sense. Really, what she's talking about is common sense. But actually, the reality is, yes, it's common sense, but excuse my language, it's bloody difficult. And in reality, that we need to actually try and tease out what does this mean. And I think what I think is hugely exciting, and when Sonia and I have been working together, is in a sense this whole area of business definition because of the, um, in the um, digital revolution, the whole area around big data, uh, again, which has been touched upon, and I thought yesterday's, I, don't, I can't see David, but yesterday's example with Barclays Bank of actually having data uh, of whatever it was, four and a half years, um, four and a half years, uh, data of transactions of however many thousand companies. It's a starting point, it doesn't tell us everything, but there are lots of opportunities there. What does this mean for the firm and the competencies of the firm? So really what I want to end with, what I want to end with is, um, this is in the MBS network, this is actually a operations director of a multimedia uh, company, a FTSE 250 company, and she's obviously, even before going into LinkedIn, she's using an internal network, essentially. And she's asked, um, email address, I wonder if you could help me. We're looking to recruit an experienced ICT strategist to join the senior leadership team. This person needs to specialise in data analytics 
and strategy. And then there are a whole load of bullets of what this impossible job needs to do. And again, I, think, I won't go through all the bullets because of time, but one of the fascinating things is that in terms of the resource-based view of the firm, what does this mean in terms of business definition? What does this mean for us? And how do we um, take that forward? What do we keep within? What mustn't we lose? What do we need to build to, to build that absorptive capacity? Thank you. Thank you very much.